It's giving the general public the the feeling that deer are horrible. Right. It's giving the, the general public the, the, the feeling that deer are these diseased animals that, that we need to be scared of, like almost like a rabid dog. Right. You know, and I'm like going, This is wrong. This is counterproductive to to their mission of taking care of the resource. Exactly. All right, so everybody, where are you going to oh. get this started? Yeah, we're, well, we're, I just hit record, folks. I just hit record. Okay. All right. All right, so we're going to get this started. This is uh, Dr. Deer that's with us, Dr. James Kroll. And uh, uh, and welcome to People Who Hunt. Okay, this podcast is all about uh, we want to we want to introduce you to different people that hunt from different walks of life, but they all have a passion and love of the outdoors and hunting. And so Dr. Kroll and I have been friends for a long, long time, Okay. And anybody who's uh, studied whitetail deer, anybody who's followed the whitetail uh, journals, if you will, that you, you've heard of Dr. Kroll, Dr. Deer, okay? I mean, you were you were a legend, okay? James, you're called Dr. Deer. Can you tell everybody how you got that name and kind of explain a little bit about what you do? Oh, yeah. Well, I've, I've worked with deer for, for almost 50 years. But I got the name by the outdoor writer Ray Sasser, uh, years and years ago, he came to see me. He was a budding uh, outdoor writer, and he said, I, w- I want to be able to write factually, so I heard you know a lot about deer. Would you spend some time with me? So I spent three days with him. He went out with us. We, he had, went out with us capturing deer. We were putting radios on deer. We were doing all the stuff. And uh, then he left. And uh, about a year later, a friend of mine calls me up, and he said, have you ever heard of Ray Sasser? And I said, well, I vaguely, well, yeah, he came to see me one time. He said, well, you need to go see Sports Field Magazine. I said, why? He said, there's an article about you in there. And I went, it wasn't easy to find one, and I found it, and, he, and there was an article in there, Dr. Deer. And then after, shortly after that, people started saying, oh, Dr. Deer. And I go, oh, p- no, 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 please don't call me Dr. Deer. And uh, this went on, and it kept, kept growing. And so I called up Ray one day, and I said, Ray, I'm going to kill you. He goes, why? He said, this Dr. Deer thing. He says, you're an idiot. It's the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah. And, of course, he's passed now. Uh, hey, hey, we lost him. But he was right. He, he was right. But there are some people, because some people do hate my guts, uh, they think I was presumptuous enough to call myself Dr. Deer. I never did that. I never did it. I just finally gave in to it. When you're a wildlife biologist that specializes in yes, white-tailed deer. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. I'm a real wildlife biologist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't just play one on TV. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a hunter. Okay. Yes, I am. There's a there's a lot of people out there that that uh, are scientists and they th- profess that they know a lot about deer and stuff, but they're not hunters. Yeah, you you realize that the the best I can best data I can get that less than half of of agency biologists hunt. Isn't that amazing? It's totally amazing. And, and, and what would you think is that is a and we want to get jump right into it because I mean this is going to be as long a podcast as, as I guess we can do. But it, but we want to give you as much good information as we can. We are uh, uh, we've been doing this a long time, okay. Mm-hmm. And and we uh, and talking politics is something that is not really cool to do for a lot of people because when you talk politics, they just eh, cut you off because right. because it's you're taking one side or the other. You said something to me decades ago that the side that you take is the deer side. That's right. Okay. And that struck with me. I'll never forget that. It's like, you know what? As long as you take care of the deer, I don't care where they live. Okay. That's the side to be on. That's right. But it seems like these biologists pick sides. They want to talk, you know, high fence or low fence or no fence or public land or private land or they're picking sides. And the thing about it is, mm-hmm. is you, your career has been built upon not picking a side, right? picking the deer side. Right. And would you address that please? Yeah. I, I, that's my obligation. I mean, uh, us wildlife biologists haven't sworn any oaths, but, but I did when I, when I started out was, was that I, I, I was trained to always, I'm tired of hearing about follow the science. I hate to use that term, but I was trained as a classical scientist. And another word for a, a classical scientist is skeptic. If you're not skeptical, you're not a good scientist. Good scientists don't believe what they see, smell, touch, feel, anything. They, they're always skeptical about things. And, you, and we don't try to prove ourselves right. We actually try to prove ourselves wrong. And I learned pretty quick that through my, through my education and training that there was 
there was politics in this. And there's a lot of, a lot of so-called scientists today let their personal philosophies get in the way. And that personal philosophy from the time I started, we all were taught to get up every morning and bow down to a big bronze model called the North American Wildlife Model. Mm -hmm. Hunter Opportunity. Yep. Yep. That's what it was all about. And, uh, uh, and then the other, the other the corollary to that was what uh, the head of wildlife, when I, when I was appointed to be the, the deer trustee of Wisconsin, uh, I, I invited them all to dinner. I wanted us to all get along, you know. Right. They were pretty upset that there was this guy coming in from Texas going to straighten them out. <laughs> but it was fun. The uh, first thing he told me was he, he thought that agencies working with private landowners was a violation of the North American wildlife model. He did. Wow. That, that private landowners have, should not have any say, really. That, that, and then the wildlife profession is... Is the are the arbiters of everything? You know, we we decide. No, we don't. Wow! This whole profession began to serve hunters. It was about game. Now, I've done a lot of non-game research and work with non-game animals. I love non-game animals, but I, I, you have to admit that hunters pay the bills. They do. If they, they're the only ones that willing to pay the bills. Mm. The other solution. <laughs> The one that a lot of these agency guys would like to have is taxes. They like the tax deal. And uh, you get somebody like Pennsylvania that has uh, a lot of the state lands money, especially oil money goes into wildlife. Uh, the, in states where they have more of that uh, tax type money, revenue, they list, that, those are the states that, that listen the least to the hunters. Well, the one thing that I'm perplexed about is is trying to understand politics i i, I mean I, I don't care whether it's a presidential politics or you know what's going on at the border but it's understanding things you know mm -hmm. i think you know i've always said if it, if it looks like a duck smells like a duck you know and walks like a duck probably a duck yeah. okay if it if it smells fishy it's probably fishy and i've always been a person to ask questions prove me wrong tell me something i don't know is what right. i like to do i mean right. I, i'm talking to somebody tell me something i don't know i i know a lot but i can learn a lot more so tell me something i don't know so mm -hmm. when all of a sudden we go and these agencies come forth with this information I want to believe them. Right. But my brain says, ask questions. Right. I want to find out, why are you telling me that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have an agenda? And the more I look at what's going on with chronic wasting disease across the country, mm -hmm. there is absolutely an agenda, in my opinion. Yours, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. And it goes back to what I just said. It, it, when chronic wasting disease came along, and by the way, uh, uh, years ago, Harry Jacobson and I, a colleague of mine that I really respect, we gave a, the plenary presentation at the World Deer Conference in Scotland. And the, thing, and the title of the, our presentation was The White-Tailed Deer, the Most Managed and Mismanaged Species. And in that presentation, we predicted about diseases and about disease issues. But when chronic wasting disease showed up, and we can talk at length about how that mm -hmm. happened, uh, they, they got excited. And, and I've been told from, from people who witnessed these things got said, was now, now we have a hammer. Now we have it. We can get rid of all those things that we don't like. We can get rid of deer breeders. Mm -hmm. We can get rid of high fences. We can get rid of supplemental feeding. We can get rid of trophy management. You know, we can get rid of all the things we don't like anymore. And that's our hammer. And then that's what's what's been happening is that it's it's just proliferating. It's become a guerrilla war between the people that that game agencies serve and the game agents. When when you take a look at it you think they're they're I've always thought to protect the resource. Okay. Right. And to protect the resource, we have to have hunting and we have to protect right. hunters' rights and opportunity to be mm -hmm. able to hunt, no matter if you hunt in a private land state like Texas or a public land state like many states. Okay. But you've you got to protect the resource. The, the thing about it is, is the decisions that they're making regarding chronic wasting disease management in some of these states is so anti hunting 
that it's clear that it's a political agenda, that they have a philosophy to, to kill hunting. Why else would they be doing it? And, right. and specifically, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, chronic wasting disease has become a very big political tool in the last five years, I guess, in the state of mm -hmm. Texas, okay? And Texas Parks and Wildlife has just loved this. I mean, it's given them the opportunity to come in and really, re really get a hammer Okay, on people because mm -hmm. they've got this disease now that they're looking mm -hmm. at, and it's so much. It's now it's elevated so much so that folks that listen, you need to understand that they are putting they have been putting billboards out on the highways. You know that, yeah. Okay, billboards inexcusable. That, yes, that chronic wasting disease is a serious disease. Okay, and 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 then they put advertising on gas pumps at gas stations. So you're going up there and you're filling up your gas and all of a sudden, boom, chronic wasting disease is so... And my take on that is like, wait a minute, it's giving the general public, because there's more non-hunters mm -hmm. than there are hunters, Right. it's giving the general public the, the feeling that deer are horrible. Right. It's giving the, the general public the, the, the feeling that deer are these diseased animals that, that we need to be scared of, like almost like a rabid dog. Right. You know, and I'm like going, this is wrong. This is counterproductive to, to their mission of taking care of the resource. Exactly. exactly. So I and, and so when I call their attention out to it and you call their attention out to it, I think that's a political thing. And some people go, Oh, you shouldn't get political. But I think we have a duty to our people to call people out. That's why I respect you right. so much. You you were on social media and you talk about things that most people won't talk about. Right. Okay. And and people are loving it because you're a fresh your breath of fresh air for people. You're you're the people that are joining you and following you now on Facebook are just it's just skyrocketing. I'm watching your numbers skyrocket. And the reason why because you speak the truth. Right. And you're telling them things that they need to know. Mm -hmm. So tell people about chronic wasting disease and what your opinion is, is how this is being used as a wedge against hunters. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you said it well. They, if I wanted to kill hunting, 80% of which is deer hunting, I would try to convince hunters and, more importantly, non-hunters, that venison was an un unhealthy food item. And that's what they're doing. If they do that, there's a, there's a lot of things that happen in, in sequence. We, we reduce the number of hunters, which these agencies would really like to do, because they want to get rid of deer. I don't, I don't know if you know, but well, you couldn't know because I, I just found out about it two days ago. Uh, Scotland... See, these things are happening all over the world. Scotland is passing a law to significantly reduce or eliminate deer in Scotland. And the private landowners who in Scotland control these deer uh, are, being, are being told by law that they're going to have to have to substantially kill off their deer so they can plant exotic trees to uh, sequester carbon. Okay, and if they don't do it, the state, the state will move in, kill those deer, and then send them a bill. Are we talking about high fence deer or low fence no, deer? No, these are deer, red deer, deer. deer. just red deer. Yeah. yeah, and there are there are some other deer too, but they're other than fallow deer, they're they're pretty much exotic. See, that is so frightening, and people it's in this country think, oh, that could never happen here. That's where you're wrong. That's where we're doing. And the other thing is. That the move is afoot, and, and I'm not one of these conspiracy theorists, you know. I'm just telling you the facts. Uh, like you said, I always talk from the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, this this apex predator thing is really scary because they want the wolf to to take over the job of the hunter. They really do. And get game out of the wildlife agency, out of the purpose of the wildlife agencies. It's there. Look at the state of Colorado, what they just did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, introducing exactly. wolves. Yep. And, and and they and trust me, they have mortality collars on them. I mean, they they're going to monitor those and they're going to treat them like uh, they're going to treat they're going to have better care than babies do, baby mm -hmm. human beings in our right. country, literally. Right. right. Okay. And that's what's sick. Okay. Yeah. It, it took a hundred years to get rid of those wolves. And what happened? Our wildlife game population went up. I mean, because right. of consequently, it did. Yeah. Okay. And then what are they doing? Taking us back to the Stone Age. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I think hunters, it is a political thing. Hunting is political. 
Right. Okay. And unfortunately, it turned it turned that way. Mm-hmm. And so, but a lot of people in the hunting industry will not get involved in politics because the corporations that control us through the finances, okay, because they sponsor the programs, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want you talking about that. I don't want. I talk about what's going to protect the future of hunting. Right. I want champions, warriors that want to protect the future of hunting. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're my friend because you're a freaking warrior. Okay. Well, you are too. And, and well. I, a warrior wants to surround himself with other warriors. Exactly. Okay. And other warriors are, uh, understand what the battle is. Okay. And when we're dead and gone, the b- battle's going to still go on. Mm-hmm. And we have to train people how to become warriors after us when we're gone. And we want to educate and motivate them to where they can, they can do so. So on your Facebook page, you're training people. You're giving them the, the information that they need to arm them with calling bull crap when they hear bull exactly crap from these right. agencies right and so have you received any kind of backlash from people i mean you, you were you were the kind of i'm going to tell you first off he's the kind of guy that he's almost like donald trump and that he, he don't need the money you're not going to influence him with money oh you can't okay. buy me you can't buy him okay he doesn't need the sponsorship he doesn't need he doesn't need he doesn't need it okay he's going to tell you the truth according to dr curl okay right and so I listen to somebody like that. You're not motivated by the money. You're motivated by doing the right thing. Right. Okay. So have you suffered any kind of, I mean, backlash, if you will, from the industry or from other colleagues that say, man, you ought to be careful about that? Uh, not from the industry, but from colleagues, yeah. I mean, uh, there are people out there, and I've been told, that hate my guts. I don't hate their guts. Right, right. You know, I'm just trying to be a good scientist. I make every decision based on two questions. Is it good for the white-tailed deer, and is it good for deer hunting? You know, that's what that's the way I judge things. There are some things I, I accept because you say yes to both those things that I really don't like, but it, I can't say that they're bad for deer or bad for deer hunting. So, yeah, but the, this, wildlife biologists can be pretty vicious. It's a click. Yeah, okay. Um, one of the things that— uh you said to me a long time ago, and I've used it, and people say, oh, that's great. I said, oh, don't give me credit for this. That's Dr. Kroll, okay, because we're talking about modern technology and all these advancements. I mean, I go out to your research facility, and I saw, like, the first game camera. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah. And it was, it's a, like Fred Flintstone camera, but it yeah. worked. Okay? It worked, yeah. and, But now, all of a sudden, we got game cameras. Bam, I get to— uh, it, no, Cellular and all right that. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it had to start somewhere. The technology right. starts somewhere. And we right. don't know where it's going, but right. you can't stop technology, no. okay? And so as we get this technology where where you have game cameras that send up signals instantly or game feeders that actually identify a hog or deer and it, with through facial recognition feed the deer, not the hog. I mean, we've yeah. got all this technology out there. And then I walk the floor of a sports show and I see 100% fair chase up on the sign. And we were walking by, and I said, Johnny, he goes, don't even get started. (laughs) Because what is that? I mean, think about that. I mean, address fair chase for me. That's a tough one. You know, that's been an argument for years. I I was amused one time just thinking about about, uh, uh, two cavemen sitting around the fire having a spirited debate over what is fair chase. I mean, could you picture that? Yeah. The, the, our our ancestors ran whole herds of animals off cliffs to yeah. feed themselves. And that was pretty fair. Yeah, <laughs> they had thousands at a time. Yeah. yeah, thousands at a time. There, there's evidence that that uh, when the bow came along, you know they were they were using throwing spears, atlatls. There's evidence all over the earth that, that when the bow showed up, they threw those atlatls down, picked up the bow. Okay, <laughs> and if we look at uh, middens uh, in Europe, I mean in the United States. Uh, we can find deer jaws, so we can actually age the find the age structure of deer that that Native Americans were killing. Okay, in 1750, the age structure went down. What happened in 1750? Native Americans got the got the black powder rifle. <laughs> so so you know it 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 you know 100 percent fair chase. That's a, that's an interesting one, you know, is uh, uh, you know I really I really don't have any problems with a, a lot of things. I remember uh, I shouldn't use his name because it may get in trouble for this. But one time Al Brothers kind of got in trouble because he said uh, he said he, he didn't care whether it was high fences or not. You know I, that ain't exactly what he said, but something like that. 
And I don't either. I, you know, I've killed very few deer behind a high fence, but I'm not against it. I'm not right. against it at all. If right. you want to go hunt deer in a high fence, hunt them. Right. If you want to hunt deer uh, out in open range, hunt them. If you want to hunt deer with a stick bow, hunt them. And Isn't one of that the, the joy about being a hunter it and is. living in a country where we have freedom, the freedoms that they allow yeah. us, that we can choose how we yeah. hunt? Yeah. And, and one of the things really, it's really killing us among our own, our own hunting brethren is this elitism. And we don't we we don't get along, you know. If you, I, I used to be invited to talk to like to a bow group, okay. Well, if I got up and I talked about, God forbid, if I ever talked about a crossbow. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I, I oh got, yeah. First time I ever used a crossbow, on uh, on one of the hunting shows, I only got about three death threats. I mean, it was it was not all that bad. Yeah. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, if you if you talk about a stick bow, then the wheel bow guys go away. You talk about wheel bows, the stick bow guys go. I mean, it's it's silly. It's just silly that choose what you want to. I got in a big debate the other night at dinner down in Mexico uh, with someone who uh, who felt like everybody should we should be only allowed to hunt with bows. It's bow hunting should be the only thing. And I'm going, <laughs> wait a minute. You know, you got what got there was I said, you know, everybody who has a preferred weapon wants their own personal season for that. You know, uh, I think we'd have if if you could kill them with a claw hammer, we'd have a claw hammer. There you go. You know, and and so you're battling all all that out, and that's elitism. I I don't care. You know, one of the things that that crossbows, the studies on crossbows showed that it keeps people in bow hunting older. The the eighty year olds are out there. It's a retainment tool. It is, and you get the young kids into bow hunting mm-hmm. earlier. And those same guys that twenty years ago were talking bad, talking smack about yeah. crossbows, yeah. now their shoulders are out. Now they're not able That's to draw right. a bow. But guess what? The crossbow keeps them out in the field exactly. longer. Exactly. And so what's wrong with that? And right. so just because it may not be for you now doesn't mean that it won't be for you later right. or for somebody else. Yeah, the, the, the person who was making this vigorous argument was a young, you know, guy that's still got a uh, athletic build and he's, you know, he's in shape. And like you said, when a man passes 50, woman too, and can still shoot a vertical bow, you're lucky. I yes. Guarantee. Or you yes. just been sitting around doing well, nothing. Well, and, and when you start taking a look at the average age of hunters, that's interesting now. When you, we start looking at this, because in order to protect wildlife, we need to protect hunting, okay? Mm-hmm. And in order to protect hunting, we have to get new hunters in. And so we need to start starting them as their, their, their children, little kids. We need to introduce them, and big kids. But the right. little kids are going to be really the guys that are going to carry the torch for a long time. I just look at it and I think, the crossbow gets him in the field like right now shooting an arrow. Right. And if you want the, somebody to go to a vertical bow, give them a horizontal bow first and let them start shooting that. And then all of a sudden, when they get old enough, they can pull a bow capable of, sh- right. of killing a deer vertically and they want to. Let them do it. But I look for it. We need to create more opportunity for hunters and not yeah. less opportunity. Yeah, we're making it really difficult for kids to get into hunting. Uh, uh, we're getting making it difficult people to get into any kind of hunting you gotta almost have a lawyer with you nowadays to go hunting yeah uh you know the and kids uh there's there are states where were kids that when i was their age i was hunting but they can't legally hunt it's, right it's but it's, they can legally do this oh yeah i mean on the yeah. telephone yeah yeah so, so it, it's what it is a matter of opportunity and i think there's that that we need to look for every opportunity, whether it's, it's opportunity on public land or either opportunity on private land. I right. mean, as a, as a private landowner, I mean, I, I know that hogs are a big deal, and I can't stand hogs. I mean, personally, I can't stand them. I mean, I, I used to, I just, I can't even stand them. It's like, there goes the I neighborhood. Hate them. I hate them. It's like, there goes the neighborhood, right. okay? I mean, I don't even like eating them anymore. I don't right. like them, okay, yeah. because they have ruined so many mm-hmm. beautiful pieces of property. Mm-hmm. And so, but I look at it and think, so consequently on our videos, I'll tell people how, and how I feel. And anyway, it's pretty obvious. And people say, well, how come you won't let people come hunt them for free? Because the lawyers have made it to where we can't let people come hunt for free. Right. Okay. When you say you just about have to have a lawyer with you when you go hunting, it's true. Yeah. I mean, you go to a ranch and the first thing you walk in the door, bam, there's a release. Right. Sign this. It's like, I'm not a lawyer. Right. Oh, I brought one with me. Would you let me know if I can sign that? Mm. And that's sad True, that it's come yeah. down to that. I mean, the old days of knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm Jim. I live down the street, and here's, here's Johnny, my son. Can you mind if we go hunting in the back 40? Those days are gone. Oh, yeah. 
you said a long time ago, Daniel Boone died a long time Daniel ago. Daniel Boone is dead. Yeah. 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 Things have changed. we got airports and schools right. and shopping malls and, and all this development stuff, and it's all built on deer habitat. Mm -hmm. And so when people start thinking about it, man, I mean, we're destroying habitat so fast, it's it's unreal. And it's like the right. land fragmentation. Address land fragmentation because many people, right. they see it right before their eyes, but they don't realize what it is. Yeah, that's, that. that's, my, that's been my crusade most of my career is fighting fragmentation uh a lot of people uh don't you know they're I, again these are these are social issues they don't like big landowners okay uh i remember uh, arthur temple who who said was essentially the owner of temple inland they had like 1.9 million acres in east texas mm. okay uh there were people who didn't like him because i mean he was a timber magnet you know they are a hedge against uh, fragmentation. They're, they're, the, the few large landowners that we have left, the large ranch owners, that we, I, I saw the other day that a uh, ranch in West Texas is up for sale. They, these big ranches. Uh, you know, you, people are jealous of, you know, that this family had these uh, hundreds of thousands of acres all these years. But the first thing that happens when those, land, when those ranches sell is they get broken up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody, you, you take beautiful examples. Is I, I, my early days of hunting were around Fredericksburg. And the ranches then were, you know, most ranches were 1,200 acres, you know, something like 800 acres. That'd be there. giant. Yeah, today. it'd be giant. I saw an ad the other day for a 90-acre exotic ranch, $1.5 million. You know, 90 acres. That's all, all people are buying now is rocks and a view. Mm -hmm. And... When you get to when you break land up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, there comes a time when it's unmanageable. Mm. When you've got those people who won't let you come on their land, who came moved to Texas from California or somewhere, you know, and they they have no hunting heritage at all, and the game management, wildlife management goes away. I guarantee you, it goes away. Uh, we've seen it in Africa, haven't we? Well, see, and, and you know what? Think about this. It's like as, as land fragmentation continues, and it will continue forever because mm -hmm. it's inevitable, okay? It's it's a ongoing more and more serious problem for wildlife, mm -hmm. okay, because that deer still wants to live on that habitat, but now all of a sudden instead of having, say, say you get 1,000 acres and you got, and that person dies and he's got four heirs. Now it's four 250-acre parcels. And one person may love hunting and want to grow a big deer. One person may hate deer. And one person, you know, they, I mean, everybody's got a different management philosophy. That deer doesn't know there's four owners now. Right. That deer travels all over that same right. thousand acres. And depending upon where he is, he's managed differently. Mm -hmm. And that deer, and the, the problem with that is now all of a sudden when that gets cut up, and that gets cut up. And that's the reason why people are building high fences at an unprecedented rate, because they're yeah. trying to protect the wildlife, what little they have left. Exactly. But what happens when they don't have any wildlife on there? What happens when all of a sudden it's been fragmented and, and everything's shot out? The habitat's good, but they don't have any wildlife. That's where purchasing deer, to me, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity for those landowners to have something that they couldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so... Texas Parks and Wildlife, I mean, deer breeders, that's one reason why deer breeders, I think it's so great that deer breeders can provide that opportunity to those landowners, okay? And many landowners are taking advantage of it. The problem is Parks and Wildlife is making it more and more difficult for that to happen. Oh, yeah, that's part of those we're going to kill it things I talked about. That one, of the, one of the main targets of the hammer, you know. What's ironic now, and I know you already know this, you know, the work that, that like Dr. Seabury and those guys are doing, uh, was looking at the genetics of, of susceptibility to chronic wasting disease. There's an out there. Uh, I'm not that worried about, about uh, the deer breeders. They're going to get themselves out of it, mm -hmm. just like the sheep herders mm -hmm. got the mm -hmm. way out of it. But there may be a solution. Remember, all these deer came to be from stocking. I have the stocking records for the state of Texas. And they all came, all the deer in the state of Texas that, that we enjoy, with the exception of the King Ranch and some of these large ranches, they, they came from, from private ranchers, from private ranchers, mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, that now we're looking at, if we got susceptible, we got resistance in deer, and the deer breeders could provide those to us, we may be looking in the future at stocking deer 
out there are, that are genetically resistant genetic to chronic resistant. wasting disease. Exactly. Yep. So, see, Dr. Seabury, we're going to have him on and do a podcast with him. He is. We are so blessed as a dear lover. We are so blessed to have this research that he has done right, right. to be able to see that they, there is hope. I mean, because in managing for chronic wasting disease, there's 30 plus states that already have it. At least three can, Canadian provinces already have it. And you can't get rid of it once you have no, it. No, you can't. But you can get rid of hunting once you have it. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is they've gone, and as you all know, they've gone and destroyed entire areas. You were up in Wisconsin. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Address what happened when they came in to control CWD. They're going to kill off the disease. They're going to kill it off. Explain what happened to them up in Wisconsin so people understand that there is no solution here. And the obvious thing is there is no solution. And it's obvious because here's a perfect example of among many. Explain to them what happened. Oh, yeah. But, but a little background to that. Uh, the University of Wisconsin was a big leader in TSE research. TSEs are the, the classification of diseases like, like a so-called mad cow disease. I hate that term. Mm-hmm. It's almost as bad as zombie deer disease. Uh, and crossfield Yakov disease in humans. And it, there's a whole host of those diseases. They were doing a lot of research. The third place where CWD showed up was at Madison, at Madison, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. right outside of Madison, Wisconsin, within 14 miles of where all that research was going on. Okay. Now, did, did it come from there? I don't know, but it's pretty suspicious when, when you had it show up in a government facility in Colorado where deer were cohabited with scrapey sheep, okay? Then those, then animals from there were sent up up to Wyoming to another research facility. And then they got That it. was the second place that it showed up. And the third place it showed up was at Madison, Wisconsin. Now, that all said, when it, when it showed up in 2001, 2002, they literally went crazy. And uh, they, they were going to, they were going to, eradicate the disease that was their goal eradicate a, a r- disease that can't be eradicated but they were going to do it the people they scared the living daylights out of the people and the people and hunters are loyal i mean hunters are i mean when you tell them that all your deer are going to die uh, one of the professors at, at university of wisconsin said that in 20 years deer would be extinct in wisconsin well it's been 20 years and they're not <laughs> far from it far from it <laughs> but anyway it, it scared them and they went out there. The first thing they they killed 172,000 deer, not bucks, but every mama, every, daddy, baby, every single spotted one. Spotted fawns. Yep, every. It was sickening. Yep. We went up there. Uh, Horace Gore and I went up there. We did a show. We won a, a Golden Moose Award for yes, you did the, what we did, and and everybody thought they were told this is going to be solve it. We just kill these deer off, okay? Well, they killed 172,000 deer. Guess what? It didn't go away. And, but they, they didn't know it didn't go away. Explain to them, once the deer were gone, what happened to the habitat and so on and so forth. Oh, what, what happened to the habitat was really cool. Uh, the habitat where they killed off 172,000 deer they improved, and the deer herd actually grew. They actually grew. And they, they got ki- better. And they got better, <laughs> and they got better age structure. And it, it, it was hilarious. And then when all of a sudden they started hunting again, that's when they discovered that, uh-oh, we still have CWD. They still have CWD. It, it, they didn't get rid of it because and here's why. You know, back to this follow the science stuff, okay? What kind of disease is it? Well, there's two basic kinds of diseases. There's one that's called a density-dependent disease, and there's a frequency-dependent disease. What those are is one of them is like like COVID, okay? Density-dependent. Where do you expect the next outbreak of influenza to happen? In Chicago or in, you know, Timson, Texas or somewhere? It's where it's going to be a lot of people packed together. A frequency-dependent disease is independent of how how many deer you have. In this case, how many deer you have. And this is a frequency-dependent disease. It's how many times they get exposed to it. And so social groups, doe groups, really are are the harbingers of of the disease. Okay, You go out there and you try to, based on a density-dependent model, you kill all those deer, 172,000. Okay? Nothing happens. You don't, you haven't done a thing. And the the legislature, thank God, I think it was in 2007, they did a review of that study and, and 
what they concluded was it was, quote, unsuccessful. Now, and we wrote our report for Governor Walker. We said it failed. And the, the only criticism from the DNR is they wanted us to remove failed from our report and replace it with unsuccessful. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, we'll, make, we'll, we'll give you that. It was unsuccessful. But it was. And it, it, uh, it's, it, 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 the thing that troubles me is that failed. But yet, what model is being used at every one of those 30 states? Everyone, everyone's doing the wrong model. And they know it's going to fail, yeah. but they're doing it. And that's the reason why all these states that don't have it, you will have it. You yeah, will have everybody it. Everybody will you, have you, it. You will have it. And the reason why is because once you start looking for it, you will find it. Right. Okay. And 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 it's and and so when when all of a sudden, like up there in Wisconsin, don't you think it's environmental now? I mean, oh yeah. It's, I mean, it's environmental. It's there. It's definitely environmental. I, I think uh, Dr. Seabury has shown that. By the way, I can't say enough about him. He he's one of us. Uh, he's my kind of scientist. Uh, I'll guarantee you, if the story were different. He would be on the other side. Absolutely no. Now, and like I said, we will have a podcast with him because I've talked to him about it. We did a we did a, a video with him here a while back, and he is unbelievable. Okay, yeah. I mean, my hat's off to him. Every deer lover's hat ought to be off to him. Right. Uh, what I want to point out is is that there are people that are listening that are opposed to high fences or to deer farming specifically, and they are concerned about chronic wasting disease. Then good. I'm glad that you're concerned about CWD. But if you're that concerned about it, then I think what you ought to do is you ought to consider what's going to be done about it. Okay, what right. can what can we actually do, and where can it be done? Right. There is no better place to do it than a research facility. Right. We have a controlled environment to be able to choose which deer breed to who, and and select these deer based upon genetics. And mm -hmm. so, if the genetic research is there for cattle to be able to evaluate cattle where they're going to have higher weaning weights or more fat or whatever it is, all these. They can do that with deer, and it is being done. That yeah. Dr. Seabury has done that. He has right. he has discovered this formula, and he has taken in blind research, been able to determine which deer are more likely to come down with CWD. Mm -hmm. And so, deer breeders are breeding away from that. Okay, yeah, we all want big antlers and big bodies and blah 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 blah, but we want healthy animals. Okay, and so you close your eyes and don't look at the antlers. Look at the the genetics and say genetically. This is what kind of deer we can build for the future of the deer herd. Mm -hmm. And so if CWD is that big a boogeyman, okay, it, it, what some of these states, and clearly when they come in and depopulate an entire area, CWD must be a big boogeyman. What would they repopulate it with? How about deer that are not susceptible to chronic wasting disease? Right, right. And the public would support that. Would yes. Would support restocking. You know, the deer, the deer that were stocked around the United States during, during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, Actually, some of them, they, they, unbeknownst to them, stocked animals that were susceptible to things like hemorrhagic disease. And, uh, and, and so they, there wasn't any thought about disease in those days, you know. And so we're, I, I personally think that susceptibility to hemorrhagic disease probably uh, can be tied, can it, there could be a correlation there with susceptibility to CWD. Absolutely, 100%. I agree with yeah, you yeah. because that's the reason why, if you take a look at these areas that have been really hit by EHD, okay, I mean, it's it has to be a genetic thing. You sit back and look at it, it mm -hmm. has to be a genetic thing because it doesn't kill them all. Right. Okay. But if, if on a on a CWD facility, let's just say a CWD positive facility, when they go in, they kill every animal out. And also, they discover one deer out of three hundred had chronic wasting disease. Mm -hmm. Think, well, doesn't that put up a flag to anybody? Right. I thought they were supposed to be highly contagious. Right. Okay. That one deer had it. They may have been, They may have killed off the most valuable deer in the world. Good that ask. could give them the scientific data, the research to be able to say we can create more animals like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that leads me up to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Research Facility. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kerr Wildlife Management Area. They had it's a research facility. Been around what fifty years? A yeah, long time. Fifty something years. And they've never supposedly brought in a deer. They've done their. I mean, got to have line breeding from, you know. I mean, bad line breeding, I guess. But they've never brought in another deer. Right. They recently came down with a CWD positive deer. We interrupted this podcast with an important message from Keith Warren. So we need to interrupt the podcast for just a moment and let you know that since the original filming 
of this interview with Dr. Kroll, uh, Kerr Wildlife Management uh, did not have a positive. It was a false positive, and therefore, uh, it didn't change what they did, okay? You need to be paying attention and find out what Kerr did, even though it was a false positive, what they did in response to this positive. It still didn't change things. Now pay attention. Now back to the podcast. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Research Facility, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's Kerr Wildlife Management Area. They had it's a research facility. Been around what fifty years? A yeah, long time. Fifty something years. And they've never supposedly brought in a deer. They've done their. I mean, got to have line breeding from, you know. I mean, bad line breeding, I guess. But they've never brought in another deer. Right. They recently came down with a CWD positive mm -hmm. deer. And you got to think how'd that happen? Right. And and that's a big question to ask, because uh, on these TSAs, there there's at least three different forms one is one is infective okay another one is genetic uh another one is sporadic spontaneously spontaneously just, developed so it happens in humans yep and there there is a, a long-standing test that could be run every time they find a new cwd positive deer in a place where they hadn't had them before they, they won't run it they won't run it. it's a western blot test it would tell them whether it was a sporadic case or not they didn't run it on the on the Kerr Wildlife deer. I guarantee you they did. Yeah, it's a research facility. Yeah. Yeah, it's a research facility. So what happened on the research facility, they found a positive, okay? And so what does a research facility do when they get a positive? They depopulated the facility. Rather than doing it. the research. Test. Rather 50, than yeah. researching the animals that yeah. were habitating with that, with that positive animal, right. they killed them, okay? Yeah. I can't understand that, and I just want somebody to answer that one question to me. How did you get it? Okay. How did it, 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 how it, did it come to be? Because, because we know, it's a, it, we were talking about genetics. I mean, it, it, you look at your family tree, okay, and you may be more susceptible to about diabetes or cancer or, you know, cardio issues. I mean, they're, they're, genetically we're all prone or, you know, we're, we're blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it, with, right. with issues. Deer have to be the same way. Yeah. They're genetically deer that were they were predisposed to be susceptible to chronic wasting disease. And we right. get that. And if that's the case, then we're growing deer and breeding programs that are less susceptible. That's mm -hmm. a good thing, okay, that hopefully we could save the white-tailed deer by growing these protective-type deer. Yeah. But spont spontaneous cases of CWD, there's nothing you can do to stop it. No, you can't. It's, it, it's can't. like having an athlete that's unbelievable shape, mostly and he has a car, uh, you know, cardiac arrest and he's dead. It's like, how'd yeah. that happen? It yeah. just happens. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you this question. That, that research uh, uh, facility there mm -hmm. been in operation 50 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. What research were they doing? Because, <laughs> I, because... I don't know. I mean, what... They, it, uh, were they still trying to prove that spike yearlings were inferior, or what were they trying to do? That why would you destroy fifty something years of, of of animals that you've got? I mean, you've got a credible amount of information on them. You're absolutely right. Why wasn't it? Why wasn't it uh, stu studied instead of of just depopulated? It's, other, it's than, a other than the they one don't. opportunity you get to truly study and study understand it. the disease that you're exactly supposedly right. studying these deer for. Exactly right. But I think what happened is they wanted the problem to go away. It, and the, the thing about it is, I just wonder, why would you kill them? Yeah. You How kill did them? you get it and why did you kill them? Yeah. Okay, and, and I think that we are owed that. Okay, I mean, if I'm concerned about deer, you're concerned. We Every deer hunter is concerned about deer. I would assume that you'd be kind of concerned a little bit about CWD, depending on, I don't know what level, a little bit, a lot of bit, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you want to know I mean, because right. we there's scientific proof that those prions that that can give a deer CWD, they can be moved in feed now in hay. Okay, right. And we know that they can they can be uh, moved in water with runoff. Okay, from one piece of property to the other. Buzzards can the move. Buzzards, them. predators can dra you know, drag a carcass sure. from one piece of property to the other. They and they're moving this uh, this chronic wasting disease right. these, these prions around. And so, but how did it happen there? It's a closed facility. I mean, it, was it a uh, some kind of a I don't know a biological mess up? Did they you know did they uh, was it a biosecurity issue? Did they did somebody go to a chronic wasting disease positive facility and not clean their boots when they came back? Because it can be in the soil. We know it can be on the bottom of sure. the truck fenders and the truck right. wheels. It could be on your boots and you walk from one facility to the other. How did it? How they get it? 
We interrupt this podcast with an important message from Keith Warren. Again, we want to point out that it was a false positive, but it still didn't change the fact that they killed all the deer that were in contact with that deer that supposedly was positive. So anyway, what amazes me is why didn't they do research? Kerr Wildlife Management Facility is a research facility, so they had a perfect opportunity to research those deer. Why didn't they do that? Now back to the podcast. The answer is if they can't say how they got it, Mm -hmm. okay, then that's important for them to say that. Because if that's the case, then what are we killing thousands of deer for around our right, country? Right. Why are we hurting people's livelihoods? Now, uh, I want to tell you, I wound up the other day. I came back uh, from on Highway 90, coming back through Castroville. This is, and I have this documented. So if anybody at Parks and Wildlife wants to see this, any politician, please call me. Please. Okay, I stopped at the, at the research, I mean, the uh, CWD check station in Castroville, Texas. Right, right by there. The other 7 day. o'clock at night, December 30th. I got it on my telephone. I'd love to show it to people. Big flashing light it says CWD check facility. Stop ahead, okay. One mile ahead, boom, there it is. I pull over. I got video of it all. Pull over when the facility's closed. Okay, seven o'clock at night. Yeah. Okay. The trailer looks like it uh, should be in the way of Laredo. It's dark. Okay. Nothing but burglar bars around it, and there's a little cardboard outside with some instructions. It's all dark now, and I took the truck light shining up. And the little toolbox over there got all the tools for you to do. Take the sample yourself. Cut the head off yourself, and then. It's like, what do you do with the sample? Oh, there's the freezer right there. Well, it's December the 30th, okay, of a holiday weekend, and there's got to be a lot of samples in there. So I'm going, okay, I act like, okay, I'm going to go open it up, and I film the whole thing, open up the cooler, and not one sample in there. <laughs> God dang. And the cooler wasn't plugged in. You're kidding. No, and I got it on video. Oh, my God. And I thought, huh? thought, this is a sham. Yeah. It is a sham, and I don't even know who to tell. And why do they close okay. it at seven? Right. Well, well, you could do it yourself, but then you're going to put it in there and it's going to rot. I, I don't. I don't, I don't know what they're doing. So they're giving the general public the idea that they are doing something about this disease right. when they're doing nothing. Yeah. Now, if you had a piece of property, would you allow anybody to do a test on one of your deer? No. I wouldn't either. Explain why. Because I don't trust them. I don't either. Okay, let me explain to you the reason why I don't trust them is because they have done things that when people do something that's untrustworthy, I believe you don't change people or agencies, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe, I don't, I don't believe anything they do because I just want to know the truth, okay? Don't right. lie to me. How did you get chronic wasting disease in that facility? I want to know. If the truth is we don't know, thank you for being truthful, All Right. Okay. But when all of a sudden, if let's just say you, you shoot a deer and you really want to help out. Do you want to help out? Do you think chronic wasting disease is a problem? And you're going to give that deer to the to Parks and Wildlife to test, okay? And all of a sudden they test it. What happens if it comes back positive? Nothing good. Nothing good. Okay. What happens to your, your hunting rights? Yep. If, you, if you're a landowner, what happens to the hunters that come there? Do you think the hunter's going to want to come to your piece of property if you have CWD on it or not? It's negative. Okay, do you think your landowner is going to be happy that you did that? Yes or no? No. No. Okay, nobody is going to benefit from that except for the Parks and Wildlife is going to come in there and control that situation because you were nice enough or gullible enough to give them a sample. Right. And what did that do to the value of the land? Oh, my God. Think about that. And I don't think that's what people think. And so when all of a sudden they've got these check stations, I think, you know what? When when before we pull the trigger on a deer in the state of Texas, in most states, okay, that wildlife owns is owned by the state the, that you're in. Oklahoma, Texas, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when I buy a license and I pull the trigger on an animal and that animal hits the deck, whose animal is that? It's yours. Mine. Mm -hmm. And I control what happens to that animal. Okay, and if I don't want that animal tested, I'm not testing that animal. Mm. It's my animal. Mm. Okay, it'd be like the state saying you're going to mandatorily test your child. I say no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Don't tell me what I'm going to do. If I don't want it, I don't. I don't have to do it. Mm. But when they this forced compliance, I just see is wrong, mm. and they're doing it over this fear. It's like okay, where has CWD ever been fixed? That's the question I always ask. Is it, show me, show me the success. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the one of the questions I ask is show me the success of the, what you're doing right now. Uh, and 
they can't. They really can't. Well, it, Johnny Hunt's I, in Missouri. Yeah, I, about I, that. I've oh, got a I different. Yeah, I've got a different question for both of you, real quick. Is not when has it ever been successfully removed, but when has it ever have ever been a substantial issue? A, a substantial Very good pro- question. W- w- that's my main question to both of you is because especially, you know, me growing up in Missouri, I really didn't start really learning about this stuff until yeah. I met Keith. Yeah. And because he's very knowledgeable on it. And most of the people out there don't understand this disease. And I personally think that it's often confused for the outcomes of like EHD and stuff right. like that, wiping right. out total deer herds. Right. So my question to you both is, when has this ever really been a substantial issue to warrant going in and wiping out the herds yourself? It hasn't. And in, in 2002, I, I'm well known for have, having said this. In 2002, I said, I was asked about, about CWD. And I said, CWD is a, is a problem if you could say yes to the following two questions. Will it decimate deer herds? And can human beings catch it? The answer to this date to both those questions is no. Yeah. So where is the problem? Yeah, that's been my question to him all the time. I mean, you'd think that Texas had no deer. <laughs> but yeah. ter- you can't we drive got, down the road with dang near hit so ones. What, what do you think the impact is of a, of a a person driving, a woman driving down the highway, and her child is maybe thinking, oh, I like to go deer hunting. Oh, so and so deer hunts, I like to go. And they see a billboard that these deer are diseased. Oh, I'm, I'm not going. And we oh, watched right. the other day, James, we watched. You remember this video? We watched the most propaganda zombie deer video I've oh. ever seen, using using videos from like you know zombie movies of zombie deer, literally it was AI stuff. It AI was not, stuff. It was not, it was not even real. Yeah. And and that's where I think you know it, honestly, especially people my yeah. age that don't do the research. And folks, I've been sitting back because these you're not going to find two more knowledgeable guys other than Dr. Chris Seabury on the subject than these two right here. And I just, you know, really encourage you to to educate yourself because working with Keith has really brought me up to speed on the subject and really looking at it like how big of an effect is this really having to warrant what's going on? It's it, crazy. It, you know, I know when the kids were growing up, and they'd say, Daddy, one of this. And I say, if you can't answer the question, if you really and truly can't, I've always said it's about the money. Yeah. Follow the money. Yeah. <laughs> Back to politics again, all of the money. It's either money or power. And, uh, you know, right now we have a continuing appropriation of $72 million to portion out to the states to, quote, control, manage, and study wow. CWD. That's frightening. And that's when that appropriation got passed, okay, uh, that, that is the marking point when, when all of a sudden— Everybody's asking, why all of a sudden does this become such a big issue in these states? Why are they they're accelerating on this? Well, that's why. They're buying trucks. They're buying. They're hiring new people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Most of whom are not competent in CWD. Yep. Uh, and it's that's where you follow it. You know, it's, it is the natural tendency of any agency bureaucracy to try to increase itself. They have more people, more everything. And that's well, what's going on right now. Well, the Texas Parks and Wildlife is a perfect example that they wound up, they brought down uh, uh, a guy from Wisconsin. He was so successful up in Wisconsin, they bring him down here, and they listen to what he says. Mm-hmm. He was so, but so he, he was not successful in Wisconsin <laughs> no. is the whole thing. No. He was not. Right. And the, the other guy they brought down from Kansas was not successful. Right. But they're bringing them to Texas and introducing, it's like, wait a minute, Texas is different than it is in, in Wisconsin. It is different than it is in mm-hmm. Kansas. This is a different culture. The land is different. The land ownership is different. Right. This is different. White tailed deer have to be managed just like any animal for the for the best management practices for where they are. Mm-hmm. And Florida is different than Montana. And, mm-hmm. and Texas is different than it was in Wisconsin mm-hmm. where he came from. And it was a failure there. Mm-hmm. And it's a failure here. Mm-hmm. And I think the more that we educate people, whether we go to these Texas Trophy Hunter shows, okay, and we, you write for the magazine and the, your Facebook stuff and, and our Facebook stuff and our YouTube stuff, where we push this stuff out, we're trying to educate people mm-hmm. about the importance of this. If you love deer, learn. We're trying to help you. We're not right. we're not talking down to you. We're talking with you. Come on with us. We need to build this army. Right. That when when Parks and Wildlife shows up, I mean, we were that deal. Uh, back at, at the Texas Trophy Hunter. August thing. 24th. 
Yep, we were there, and I'm going to tell you all something. It was it was a, it was a thing that they're going to Parks and Wildlife is going to come. It's a town hall meeting in front of these people, and we sat up there, and Dr. Cole got up there, and I mean he he hit it, and and I got a chance to get on the mic a little bit, and it became clear to everybody that was there we we're being lied to. Oh yeah, okay. we it, knew it I already. Proved it. I proved it. You yeah. know that that's the thing. Uh, you're talking about about what I'm doing in social media and whatnot. Uh, I, I I adhere to the truth, and I never I'm, I'm I'm like a lawyer. I don't ask a question I don't know the answer to. Yep. And I asked the question. I asked two questions. Uh, the first one was, is there is there any peer reviewed science that has shown that chronic wasting disease has affected fecundity or recruitment of white-tailed deer? They looked at me in the eye and said yes. And where is it? When when they said yes, my heart leapt. And I said, and is there any uh, any documented uh, by necropsy evidence that a white-tailed deer has died from chronic wasting disease in the state of Texas? The answer was yes. 54 days later, and they, and they, they agreed to send me the documentation. I, I sent them, I don't know how many emails, saying, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? 54 days later, they sent me this litany of literature that, in essence, said that there is none. They, they couldn't prove it. So I was lied to. But more importantly, those, all those people, those landowners, those hunters that showed up there, they were lied to. They were all lied to. Yeah. And that's the reason why I say it's okay to ask questions. And just because they have a badge on, just because they work for the government, doesn't make them an you authority. You have to be afraid of them. I mean, okay. they work no. for us. It is, they work for us. Okay. And so I literally, I mean, I, I've got a deal. I, mean, I, I know people love game wardens, and I, there are some really good game there's wardens. There are some great game wardens. There are some really good ones. But there's some that are not really good, just like there's some, you know, doctors and lawyers and like a TV show hopes got aren't very good. OK, but we try to be good. But I don't trust them. And it's for that reason. You know what? When they show up at my place, they're not welcome. They're just not. And I mean, and the reason why is because you work for an agency that's proven themselves to be liars. That's okay. a shame. And it is a shame because I'd like to welcome, have a cup of coffee, come sit down and eat a sandwich oh, yeah. with us. And, and you are more than welcome. But when they come with a with us in their crosshairs, then they're not welcome at my place anymore. Hmm. And I mean, and that's just a shame. I don't want to be that way, but they have driven me to be that way. Hmm. And they know I feel that way. And I know for that reason, they really want to get me doing something. It's like I'm not doing anything wrong. It's just I'm tired of you treating me like I'm doing something wrong. I'm tired of you. Right. I'm just tired of the oversight and oversight that they it's just they won't leave me alone. The, you know, the, uh, chronic wasting disease. Johnny and I went to Oklahoma two years ago, and and we both shot deer, and uh, we found out that we couldn't bring Oklahoma deer into Texas. Right. Okay. Now, and and it was like, holy crap! What do we do? I mean, literally, what what do we do? I mean, we were loaded up. We were re we were heading back home, talking to somebody. Said, "Man, you better not cross the borders." What are you talking about? We can't bring those deer back the way they were to Texas. Right. And then I went yeah. to look it up on the site to get the actual law. Right. And I couldn't find it to save my life. Knew it was a law, but couldn't find it. No, you are gonna find it. Yeah. And so, so they make it to the point that you just can't you can't comply. You may want to. It's like, okay, so what do we do? We're freaking out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, I guess let's bone the sucker out. I, I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, and so I think that we, like you said earlier, you got to have a lawyer to go hunting nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's almost the truth. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, I mean, there's some really good game wardens. There's some good people working for Parks and Wildlife. But there's an agenda that seems to be out there that does not stop. It is stealing private property owner rights. And that's bothers me. I mean, my I mean, whether you have a hundred acres or a hundred thousand acres, right. it's your property. Yeah. And if you want to make it a wonderful wildlife place for deer, it's your property. And if you want to make it a ball field, it's your property. And God bless the people that want to dedicate that property to wildlife. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What would you say, what would the both of you say is the best way for people out there that given the propaganda are concerned about this disease to truly educate themselves? I got a way. Follow his Facebook yeah. page. 
Okay. Follow his Facebook page, read his writings and listen to what he has to say. Okay. And, 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 and pay attention to what Dr. Chris Seabury is doing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there are some people that they don't like me because I take a stance like, wait a minute, I'm for the deer first. That's all I'm for. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and then everything else, we can work everything else up. But if you're not for the deer first, then you're probably not on my team. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I just think follow, follow Dr. Crow. Yeah. Okay. Because we need people that speak the truth. Okay. And the truth, mean it's not a popular thing in today's world. No, you know? I guarantee it's not. But we're, we're dedicated to that. I, we do not put anything on that is not factual. It, we, it has to have the science behind it. So, and it, the sad thing is that, that the science is not behind behind a lot of this stuff. The, you know, the research is being done. We, we go back to the Kerr area, the lost opportunity there. What research goes on? What research gets funded? You know, you can learn a lot by, by seeing, by looking at what projects get funded. The kind of research that has been done predominantly with chronic waste disease is what I call Frankenstein research where they're cramming, uh, you know, contaminated material into the brains of living deer. Literally. 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 Cramming, literally okay, cramming I mean, it, or, or worse yet, they did a study where they, where they force-fed feces and urine down the throat mm. of deer. And they're not doing it just white-tailed deer. Yeah. It's, that, they're doing it with access deer, now, as you now well they're, know. Now, but see, that, that's again, we're going back to agendas. Uh, the state agency hates a- ac- exotics, but they particularly hate axis deer. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, axes are not susceptible species. Okay, but they're trying to but make them. But they're trying to make them, and if you force enough enough bad prion material into the brain of an animal, you may get them to get what is called prion disease, which is not chronic wasted disease. It's a prion disease, so it's artificial. But that's what they want, so they can then start an extermination program of axis deer. Now, do do I think axis deer can be a problem with white tail deer? Of course I do. Mm-hmm. You know, well we can talk about that science all day long, but but don't don't do that Frankenstein stuff. Yeah. It's, can you see scary. Wuhan lab? That's what that's oh. my comeback to that. It's like they're creating something here that that they may not. I mean, they clearly want to do this. Right. But I don't think the general public knows that they're doing this and they're doing this with with our money. Right. They work for us, and they're they're supposed to be in charge of taking care of our wildlife. And right. this is something. And, and I think part of our taking care of wildlife is taking care of our Texas culture, our heritage, land ownership. And when they start take coming after that this one all of a sudden i stand up go uh uh-uh, exactly. you're not yeah and there's a huge difference between possibility and probability you know is it possible that a human being could fly well it's possible but how probable is it mm-hmm. and that's why we work in, in this you know this disease stuff is is it possible that this is going to happen well maybe if we keep pushing it we could get something uh but is it probable i i contend at this point in, in all of this, that if a human being ever contracts chronic wasting disease, there are a huge contingency of people that we deal with that will throw a cocktail party. Oh, no, without question. They will yell hallelujah. They will, they, they will be the biggest blessing ever for them. Yeah. Because but it will validate every single thing they've been oh, wanting. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and here, here are the facts about mad cow disease, okay? Mad cow disease... Uh, had a variant. It probably came originally came from scraping, but it, it had a variant that that was shown to to affect some human beings. Okay, how many in all of the world? Only about two hundred and something people have ever contracted that variant, and they were genetically predisposed to get it. Now, I figured it out. It was two, I think it's something like 200 million metric tons of uh, beef were eaten in Europe during that time, period since mad cow disease. Now, there's risk to everything, risk benefit, but my gosh, what is the probability? In, in Texas, we, we've got, you know, like two, two per 10,000 infect- positives. Now, is that something else that, that we need to point out? Testing positive to to CWD prions is not having the disease. Yeah, point that out, please. It's not having the disease. You have to be clinical to have the disease. The deer does. By clinical, we mean to, to have 
have encephalopathy. You know, there has to be erosion in the, in the brain, okay? If you just have prions in your system and you test positive, that's not having the disease. Pure and simple. And isn't it amazing how when you get re your results back, it will say, uh, it doesn't say yes or no. It's just non-detected. Not detected. Yeah. It, it, you say, well, is this negative? Oh, no. No, it's not detected. Right. Well, what Yet. does that mean? Yeah. yeah. They always leave that out. Yeah. Yeah, always yeah. leave that out. Yeah. But you know what? But we're going to run out of time for this. And first of all, I want to tell you, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. God bless you. We're just like, I just want to hug you because it's, you are, you're what more people need to listen to, in my opinion, right. about just get the facts. Right. Get and, the facts. And nobody should worry. I'm not giving up. And so I, how long are you going to do this for? I can answer that. Yeah. Till God takes you home. God takes me home. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Okay. And I'm like Kid Rock. I can't be canceled. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And I, I'm the same way. I, I mean, people say, how long are you going to do this for? We love till, it. Until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why is because I believe that there's a part of me that believes I'm supposed to be here to help protect the future of the outdoors. Right. And I think that's the same with you. You are here. And, and and we'll talk about it on another podcast now because you know this this is just getting us started because you, you had a very serious heart surgery here a little over a year ago right okay and you pulled through it with with a lot of prayers okay yeah. and you're here for a reason mm -hmm. I think we're all here for a reason oh I do it's, I think what we need to do is we need to figure out the reason why we're here and I think the older you get in life the more wise you hopefully become right and trying to figure out why am I here why am I really here. And I think that we're here to help protect the future for the outdoors, the outdoors people that aren't even born yet. So yeah. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being on the on the on the show with us, but I appreciate you being a warrior for the cause. So uh, likewise, my dear friend. Thank you very much, Doctor Kroll. Where can everybody find you all all across the board if they want to learn more about CWD yeah. and learn get to know more about you? Fastest place is the Facebook page. Okay, just Doctor Deer. Okay, we'll put that up on the screen. Yeah. Um, and for all you folks watching, uh, this is the People Who Hunt podcast. And, and I want to tell you all thanks for watching. But if you go on his Facebook page, he answers, okay? I mean, he he, he responds. That's the reason why it's so successful. He, he'll he get on there and respond. It's like, because I know him, and I know it's him responding, okay? Yeah. So he's responsive, and uh, we want to be responsive to you. So if you want to reach out to us, please reach out to us, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. People Who Hunt can be watched on Facebook and YouTube and listened to on all major platforms.